Um, welcome everyone to the live discussion panel of Frontlines, The Choice 2020, Trump versus Biden. Um, this screening event is in conjunction with the Wingate Museum of Art at Hendricks College. Um, if we weren't in a pandemic right now, we would all be in person and it would be in the um, the theater at the, the newly built museum on campus, but we have to do it virtually. Um, but it's okay, I'm glad everyone came and you know supported the film. Um, as a film associate, I and my fellow film associate, Sophia Stokey, um, we curated the screening event together and we're just excited to present it to everyone. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the film. I really appreciated it, um, especially being a sophomore in college. Um, I'm just now starting to get into politics and like understanding it and developing my perception of the political world. And so, yeah, it was a great film to see um, and kind of see like the um, the lives of Trump and Biden. And it was kind of like a very unbiased look at look at that. So. I really appreciate it for that. And I'm glad we have people here who have actually worked on the film. So yeah, I think we'll have a great discussion. But before we get to hear everyone else's thoughts, I'd like to briefly just introduce everyone on the panel. So we have five panelists here with us today. The first is Gabrielle Shonder. She is a multi Emmy award winning producer and reporter with the Kirk Documentary Group and the critically acclaimed investigative documentary series Frontline on PBS. Gabrielle studied politics at Hendricks under Dr. Jay Barth, who is our moderator tonight, and Dr. Kim Maslin, who was another panelist tonight. And she graduated in 2007. She attended St. Peter's College in Oxford during her junior year and received an Odyssey grant to study the origin of apartheid education policy in Cape Town, South Africa. So everyone welcome Gabrielle. Thanks for having me. Our next panelist is Brooke Nelson. She is a researcher with the Kirk Documentary Group and the critically acclaimed investigative documentary series Frontline on PBS. Um, before joining Frontline, she was a staff writer at Reader's Digest. Brooke graduated from Hendrix in 2017 with a degree in international relations. Everyone welcome Brooke. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Joshua Glick. He is an assistant professor of English, film, and media studies at Hendrix College and a fellow at the Open Documentary Lab at MIT. His research and teaching explore global documentary, race and representation, and emerging media formations. Dr. Glick is currently co-editing the Oxford Handbook of Documentary Media, which brings scholars and practitioners into dialogue about the ethics and craft of social justice, social justice filmmaking. Everyone welcome Dr. Glick. Thanks for having me, it's a great time. Our next panelist is Tamika Edwards, um, JD. She is a native of Little Rock, Arkansas. She has over 20 years of experience in politics, public policy, and community development. Everyone, welcome to Mika. Our next panelist is Dr. Kimberly Maslin. She is a professor of politics at Hendricks College. She teaches courses in American politics, political philosophy, and gender studies. Recent publications include the experimental ontology of Hannah Arendt with Alexington Press and the paradox of Miss Marple, Agatha Christie's epistemology and clues, a journal of detection. In her leisure time, she enjoys hiking, swing dancing and watching her son play baseball. So everyone welcome Dr. Maslin. And last but not least, we have Dr. Jay Barth. He is our moderator for tonight. He is a former M.E. and Emma Graves Peace Emeritus Professor of Politics at Hendricks College. He is also Chief Education Officer for the City of Little Rock, coordinating the city's work to support education from birth through higher education in Little Rock. He also presently serves as Vice Chair of the Downtown Little Rock Community Development Corporation and as a member of the boards of Central Arkansas Water, the ACLU of Arkansas, and Planned Parenthood Great Plains. So welcome, Dr. Barth. Thanks. Thank you, Jasmine. 
And uh, my last full-time semester at Hendrix, uh, Jasmine was in my uh, uh, the Engaged Citizen course with uh, Dr. Christy McKim, uh, which was, of course, about uh, film and American politics. So uh, uh, thank you, Jasmine, for uh, getting us all together tonight and for your work, uh, for, for your work on this endeavor. Um, it's so great to see uh, all of our, our panelists uh, tonight. And uh, although I'm, I'm sad we're not in the same room, it certainly made uh, Gabby and Brooks travel easier uh, to, uh, to get here via Zoom rather than uh, a much more complicated uh, mode of travel. So thank you all uh, so much. Uh, and I want to I want to start with uh, and I will call Gabrielle Gabby. She gave me permission today. She is Gabby. She will, always will be. Uh, uh, when she was at at Hendrix, we, she was actually on my orientation trip uh, um, in uh, probably I guess two thousand three or so. Uh, so uh, a lot of time has passed. And and Brooke, another great student uh, at, at Hendrix. Um, I want to start with them though to talk about kind of. Uh, the construction of this film because it's a it's a complicated film and in, in that it's really uh, two films to, uh, kind of woven together in a very interesting way and um, Gabby do you want to get us started you've worked on um, a couple of these now I guess at least two or three now and how how does this process work just kind of walk us through the mechanics of it a lot of mechanics of it. <laughs> so we, and Brooke manages many of the mechanics. So she's gonna, she's gonna be wonderful to sort of talk about um, exactly how we break down our scenes. But ideally we sort of approach these two figures as kind of characters that we want to um, better understand. And so what we're looking for are inflection points in each of their lives that we can somewhat match up against one another. And so that usually works out to being about eight scenes each um, and so we, you know, are sort of seeing Donald Trump at military school and we're wondering, well, where is Joe Biden around that same time? Well, he's, you know, he's sort of overcoming his stuttering. And, and so can we kind of line up those scenes? Can we cut in between those? Those are sort of the big kind of questions we ask at the beginning of a project. And then we go out and we start shooting interviews and we try and figure out if anyone out there agrees with us that these are the most important moments in their life. Um, and usually... There are a few that kind of fall out, but um, but ideally that that's sort of where we begin is just kind of picking those like kind of 16 scenes. Great. Brooke, you want to talk about your your role on the project? Sure. Yeah. So one of the big parts of my job is I create what's called the timeline, which is basically just a chronology of the biggest events that happen within the scope of the film. Um, so I actually, for this film, created two separate timelines, one for Trump and one for Biden. Um, and just uh, through reading s books that they had written, through books that had been written about them, um, I started filling in sort of the key moments of their lives. Um, and what's really interesting is once you lay out all of those um, key moments in sort of a chronology, you start seeing these overlaps between them. Um, and that's where you sort of get the, uh, the interwoven nature of the film. Um, these are two men who are born during in, in similar, a similar time and who grew up in similar times. And so there are a lot of key moments in their lives that end up overlapping, which is really interesting. Very good. So um, Gabby, you also, um, you, you were a direct, uh, you were a reporter on the the 2016 film, but you were you reported on the Clinton side, right? That side of that uh, that story. Um, but of course, the Trump story was told in 20 in the 26 uh, 2016 version of the story. Did you kind of try to start from scratch in 2020, um, or did you did you consciously avoid material that had been included four years ago, or did you just say? you know, I'm, I'm going to use that as a starting point and, and, and take it from there. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think I hit you up for advice back in 2016 about Clinton sourcing in Arkansas, actually, and it was pretty fun to come back to do some interviews in Arkansas um, for that side of the film. So, yeah, you know, what was so funny is the Trump backstory was totally new to me in many ways. Um, our, our colleague Jim Gilmore had reported that out back in 2016 and then we kind of flip-flopped. So when Trump won, I started covering the Trump White House 
Um, but I didn't really have the institutional knowledge that sort of Jim had really cultivated in the, the previous film. And so I had to kind of play catch up. So this time around, I would say I sort of purposely avoided the 2016 film because I didn't want to use it as a crutch. And I also thought, gosh, the political atmosphere 2016 it felt like a different planet, right, than 2020. I mean, now we know so much. We've seen all the archival footage. Like the, the real challenge is like, what is unique here and what don't we know? Um, especially because our audience is like also hypersensitive and aware and, and monitoring all of the news. And so, you know, you gotta, you gotta sort of think creatively about new stories. Um, and so the lens of 2020 kind of helped us a lot. We decided pretty early on in the process, we were gonna fixate on um, race and crises and how these two had approached both of those subjects throughout their life. And those kind of became the through lines thank goodness we came up with that <laughs> concept because I think it it was it was a tough project, but it became a little bit more manageable to sort of then pinpoint throughout their, you know, entire chronologies every time they had faced both of these issues. Mm -hmm. Good. So Brooke, when did you come to the project and, um, and how, how long have you been working on this? Yeah, so I've worked for Kirk Documentary Group and Frontline since March of 2018. Um, but we started working on this project, I think, in May, if that's correct, Gabriel, uh, May of this year. So it was right before, or, you know, we had the pandemic to consider, um, but it was right before the country sort of erupted with um, a lot of racial reckoning. And so um, these were moments that we were watching and considering as the as the research and kind of planning phase of the film was was taking place interesting and Gab gabby that's about kind of normal is is you kind of start about seven six months in advance yes yeah, exactly six seven months is about is about right and i would say brooke starts super early <laughs> brooke starts with like that initial like timeline and research and sort of prepping that so we start to kind of we spend about a month reading in and just kind of getting familiar with what we're going to cover and then we kind of become mini experts on on these particular subjects and brooke sort of is organizing all of that material for us to kind of just do a, a total document dump into our brains so that when we're in interviews, we can make some sense about what, again, what sort of stories we're going after and what we're hoping to, to cultivate. Yeah. So uh, Josh, I want to come to you and, and talk a little bit about kind of the, the artistry of this film. Uh, um, are these two films woven together? Um, um, and I guess maybe that's a question of whether it is, uh, should be seen as, as two, two interlocking films are really, you know, a single, uh, film project, uh, kind of how, how, how do you think about it when you, when you watch it because, uh, uh, because of, of the unique nature of it. Uh, and I, I guess I'll just kind of let you riff a bit on, on what works about this, this project, both as in the 2020 version, but maybe the series of films that I know you've paid a lot of attention to because of the nature of your research. Oh uh, yeah. Um, sure. And, and I should, First of all, I'll just say thank you, you know, so much for playing this event, for Jasmine, for Jay, um, you know, for moderating, and also shout out to my parents. I think I think they're listening in in, in DC right now. Um, it's a great e evening activity. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I, I think the you know the the art of this film, I mean, worked worked really well. I mean, documentaries to some degree, the kind of art of synthesis, you know, of braiding together just different kinds of material. Gabrielle and Brooke just sort of spoke to you know the practice and to the craft of that. Um, I mean, documentary as, as a form, I think, does really well in terms of synthesizing different kinds of interviews, archival footage, voiceover, all of these kinds of things. So, I mean, to have these two life stories sort of connect in this way and, and intersect and diverge, I mean, I think that worked in a really engaging way. I mean, particularly for this film, and I think maybe this series, I mean, one of the things it does is really immerse um, audiences, you know, a kind of eloquent and, and rigorous immersion in, in primary documents. I mean, to get the stuff of their lives, their, their political life, their, their personal life, to do that by way of photographs, social media posts, interviews, these kinds of things, um, and to really spend time with these documents, these mini archives that kind of constitute a, a life for each person. And I think that's one of the things the film does in a really sort of artistic way and a really bold way um, and really informative way as well. It's being a kind of expository documentary. I think the other thing you know, that this film does and, and, and this series does 
um, you know, but, but this film in particular, I mean, it gives us a sense of how um, both Biden and Trump were, I mean, their sort of public identity was really forged by way of media, um, you know, for Biden in terms of, you know, the, the interviews, um, hearings, things like that. And for Trump, you know, re uh, reality TV, pro wrestling and tabloids. And I mean, just to have that tremendous amount of material sort of tightly woven together, um, I think gives us a good sense of the relationship to media, but also, I mean, just how primary documents can come together, you know, in an expository documentary form to really give us a sense of the historical life of each candidate and, you know, how the past has made them into the individuals they are today. Yeah, great. Um, Jasmine, I'm gonna ask you, uh, so uh, what direction do we need to give to folks who are watching in terms of, of questions they may wanna uh, introduce? Should they just put that in chat? Is that the? Uh, on, on the OV side, they're putting um, questions in the chat and there is a lot of questions, um, but feel free to go at your own pace. We can like uh, hold off the questions till the end if you'd like, or we can get to a few now and then transition back to the other panelists. But okay. yeah. Yeah. So Jasmine, if you um, can you cut and paste those into into our mm -hmm. chat, and that way I'll yeah. just kind of pull them into the conversation if that if that's cool. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna I do want to get to to Mika and Kim, uh, and then we'll kind of start weaving in other questions. Um, Tamika, Kim, um, I'm going to kind of get y'all to talk a bit about the substance of the of the material that's included here. We have two figures who are, as Josh suggested, uh, either in their political lives, as as with with Biden, or in their kind of uh, uh, celebrity and now political life with with Trump. We've got two individuals whom we know a lot about. We think we know a lot about. And Tamika, what? Was there anything that that was new to you, either in terms of the, the the substance itself or the way in which it was framed in this film, that kind of made you think about one or both of these uh, characters uh, in a in a slightly different way? So, what was interesting to me is really seeing things side by side, and so you know, throughout either one of them, um, you often hear just anecdotally how they were and how they behaved and um, and how they governed. And so to see that long period of time just kind of shortened, but then to see the contrast of what actually fueled them, I think was astonishing for me. So it's not one of the lines where the gentleman said that Trump admitted that he was the same person since the first grade. I mean, that was pretty powerful. And even at the beginning of talking about this is the battle of the soul of America. And I've heard that play out quite often, but what I saw throughout this long time period that was shortened was that they are the same person. Um, they may have evolved just a bit and um, one has may have matured just a bit, but their base and their foundation and the way they approached problems, the way they took in life remained the same. And so they were who they were and they are who they are. Good. Do you have anything that, that struck you as a, as a, a particularly new uh, perspective or new material? I think, Kim, you're muted. <laughs> I, I have forgotten about 88. Hmm. And, and I guess my, so I also was growing up in the afternoon. Kim, you're, I think we may have some sound. The sound's going in and out. It may be her fan. If you have headphones. Mm -hmm. um, let me try it and then I'll fix it in a minute. Um, I, no, you faded out again, Kim. We're going to come back. We're going to come back to you um, in just a second. But I think that's a great, great start in terms of of of, of that crucial uh, political moment for for uh, for Joe Biden. Um, we have had a couple of questions, uh, kind of about the uh, the the production process, um, and um, and it's. 
probably a, it's a Gabby Brook question. Were there were there folks who really wanted to get included in this uh, in this tale as interviewees that you just couldn't get to folks that you really thought were important to telling parts of those uh, uh, parts of the timeline that Brooke created that just were inaccessible? And if so, who, who, who did you really want? Hmm. Gosh, that's a good question. It's a really good question. Um, you know, COVID made people inaccessible. So that was one, that was one challenge, right? So as Brooke mentioned, I mean, we only have, we only shot this film during this time. So the only options available to us were remote interviews, which is like something none of us had ever um, done. And uh, it's hard enough to get people to cooperate for interviews. Um, it's even harder to say, oh, and by the way, like we're going to ask you to do this remotely and I'm gonna send you, we designed like a camera kit our team did. Um, and we're gonna ask you to set up a camera kit that's gonna take up an hour. And then we wanna talk to you for like another hour and a half, two hours. Like, how do you feel about that? So I would say not everyone agreed to um, those parameters. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know if a, a particular name kind of comes to mind as somebody we probably Brooke would, would remember. I think of, I mean, I reached out to 80 people on the Trump side of this film and we got, gosh, 26 total-ish, I think. Does that sound about right, Brooke? Brooke can fact check me on this. Yeah, I think total we interviewed 47 people 40. for Biden and Trump combined. Yeah, and so, you know, the return rates on those <laughs> requests is not like amazing. Um, so there were definitely a lot of folks in that category. You know, okay, here's a regret I have. So um, always the family on the Trump side of the film have tried, we tried in 2016. My colleague, Jim, who covered Trump in 2016 is actually mentioned in Mary's Trump's book as like, there was a frontline producer who reached out to me um, and I never returned his call. So like we, we try really, really hard to get families to participate, especially in this case, when we have pretty good access on one side, we really you know find that it's so critical to balance that out. Um, and so I struck out definitely on the, on the Trump family members outside of Mary, but Mary kind of does a different thing. Um, that's a big regret. And then I also, uh, you know, I've always kind of wanted some of the New York Titans, like the property real estate sort of billionaires club that has kind of kept Trump in that inner circle even to today. And I got really close to like a few and I thought they were going to go for it, but they like at the last minute were sort of like, ah, uh, this is a little too risky for me to like go on record and support the president at this time. So those are kind of my big ones, mm -hmm. family, billionaires. <laughs> I'll just ask a quick question. I'll go to Brooke, but Gabby on on Mary Trump, who obviously has become a a media figure in her own line, in her own right, an author, um, obviously, um, who is somebody who, who obviously has a, a different take on her uncle. Um, how did you talk to her directly? Were you the yeah the, yeah yeah? What how um, how 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 reliable um, a narrator? was she based on yeah your yeah it's a great, it's mm -hmm. a great so i i found uh so the mary trump saga was a long one for for me so i as i mentioned we had wanted her since 2016 didn't work out 2020 comes around um i had sort of just uh heard a rumor on like a late sunday night that she was working on a book and so i track her down on twitter and i see her entire like twitter page is just branded in blm and you know uh resist imagery and all of these things. And I was like, gosh, I don't know if she's writing a book, but if she is writing a book, like this is somebody we need to like lock down fast. And so we started sort of pursuing her before really the book was even announced. Then the book was announced and that became like a, uh, obviously a big legal, um, you know, war. And so we sort of navigated the interview request around that time period. Um, but throughout it, um, I just, like read that book as fast as I could because it was such a black box for a lot of reporters for a really long time, which was the house in Queens, you know, uh, Donald Trump's early years. And so um, that is where Mary Trump is good. Mary Trump is not good when you pull her into other realms and ask her for hot takes. And so we sort of just kept her in the time period and with the people that she has that sort of firsthand account and that reliable firsthand account about and we didn't use her in her, you know, um, sort of own opinions about a particular moment she wasn't present for or was kind of pontificating about. Um, 
So like, I know Kim was asking about 88, like I did, I was super curious to know, like Mary, I think went to Columbia undergrad or she was at Columbia at one point and I was like, oh my God, was she there then during sort of Central Park Five, Rudy Giuliani's first, you know, that would be freaking fascinating if she could say, here I was uptown reading the papers, seeing what my uncle was doing. And so I tried that with her and she like was definitely not <laughs> there during that time, but could say, no, but my, you know, my grandparents were racist. And they used to say all these like anti-Semitic and like horrendous sort of slurs around me all the time. And so you could sort of say like, okay, we can use Mary for that scene. Um, and she's going to be okay there. Cool. Kim, uh, welcome back. Uh, and uh, let's pick up with your thread about your kind of, uh, um, kind of wasn't new necessarily new news, but your kind of, consciousness about 1988 as a result of this uh, of this film. Yeah, so, so I have forgotten about Biden in 88, but I definitely remember when Obama announced him in 2008 thinking, Ooh, <laughs> wow, are you going to be able to keep him on a short of a leash if this doesn't become a problem? And then the, the up you're, you're kind of fading in and out. You, it, it's good and then it's soft. So I don't know what you need to do. And then I, I got fascinated by the comparison between um, Obama picking Biden and Biden picking Harris. And, and the way that the race themes were if it might allow us to have a race in this country. And, and we I'm going to pick up, I can hear, I heard just enough that I'm going to, I'm going to pick up with that thread because I think it's a great thread about the, the role of race in this, uh, in this, in this, in the saga of both of these men. Um, and I do want to, I want to talk about that. Uh, that was, um, I think it has been a while, obviously, since I saw the 2016 uh, film, but it was certainly not as pronounced a component of the 2016 mm -hmm. uh, story of Donald Trump, for sure, um, uh, including the Central Park Five and other elements. Um, it's it's a real thread here. Um, I want to talk about that, but then also uh, one question that came in was one aspect of race that was maybe not featured as as uh, as markedly when it came to Vice President Biden, and that was the 1994 crime bill, which has obviously been a very important part of his his story. Um, any, um, Tamika, do you, I saw you nodding. Do you want to pick up and talk a little bit about how race is, is uh, serves as a, as a thread in the story of, of these, uh, these individuals? What struck you about that? Well, I think, you know, what the question is alluding to is the factor that race played in the level or the amount of Black people who were disproportionately sent to prison during that time based on this being hard or, you know, tough on crime and hard and doing the things necessary to get drugs off the street and to connect um, people, people of color, particularly black people with that. And the disproportionate amount of black people there, but the impact that it has had on black families. And we're now seeing 20 to 25 years later, that terrible impact um, and how that even struck Hillary Clinton when she was running in 2016 because President Clinton or at the time Bill Clinton was the president. Um, and so there are so many backstories with even black elected officials who supported that particular legislation and how visceral it was on, um, on the black community. And so you do see like this thread with Anita Hill and the white men all um, on the panel with the Senate and what do you do? But then I think it goes back to what I said earlier when you asked about what this side to side view was of the apologize and move on. But with Trump, it was never apologize and just turn around. And so you see those current, those same patterns of, oh, I did something wrong, let me apologize and move on about it, which I think gives um, Biden a, a 
redeeming type way because people can appreciate when you say when you apologize when something's wrong and they may give you a little grace later on but what will continue to come up is the 94 crime bill um the crime legislation um because it had such a terrible impact on black people and um, not only their economic movement, but um, the more and more we saw black people as criminals. And so then when you move to 13, the, the film by um, um, DuVernay, Ava DuVernay, you see the growing numbers of black people who were um, imprisoned and you saw that huge increase after that crime bill. Um, Josh, you want to talk, I mean, obviously, uh, race in, in film is one of your areas of, of real interest in research. Do you want to talk some about the way in which race is, is, is kind of dealt with in this documentary? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it comes up, I mean, certainly as we've been talking about, I mean, in relation to these, you know, two candidates and their political life, but I, I think one of this sort of moves the, the film makes, and this is why I think it's, I mean, as a series, it's really compelling. I mean, it takes us sort of through, you know, the particular life or, or the lens of these individuals to kind of shine it outward onto American society. I mean, you know, New York, but the, you know, the country more generally, I mean, that, you know, issues of sort of, you know, race and, and politics are, you know, intimately connected. They have been throughout history. I mean, they sort of intersect in particular moments of say a campaign or, uh, you know, a piece of legislation, but um, I mean, I think one of the things that the film, you know, the the documentary does really well is, you know, in those moments, it, it kind of, you know, moves from the candidate to, you know, the larger, you know, societal debate or the kind of issue that's that's playing out, say, in the media, um, and you know, it, it sort of moves beyond just the individual, but to the larger kind of situation that, um, you know, is being attended to. Jay, can I just, can I say one more thing um, that struck me as Josh was talking about the role of media is how early on these two men shaped how we, our way of life now. Like early on, they had a hand, um, the 94 bill, the Central Park Five, the rhetoric, media, at a very early time, they were able to dictate exactly what we see now and having those individuals side by side, you see what their beginnings were. You, and now they are um, head to head in the battle, as we say, you know, the soul of America and seeing what's, um, what the consequences are or what will eventually happen to us based on their beginnings. It's just, it's kind of fascinating how everything was just woven together in the roles that they played early on. So I, I enjoy watching it and couldn't put, it, I mean, I just like couldn't look away because I kept thinking to myself, I'll miss something. Um, and, and you asked earlier about what I was surprised about. I was trying to continue to go through what it was, but the military beginning of, of Donald Trump and um, how he played out and rose to the top even being the leader of his dorm and how the two individuals who were his classmates, you could tell they had some type of trauma even in recalling what was happening because they knew how one would be outcasted if um, he made the wrong turn or made a mistake. And then you see that continue to be played out even now in the administration. Good. Brooke, I'm going to go back to you. Um, and uh, you you created this big timeline, and and obviously events that probably uh, were pretty prominent. There's just one space, right? It's only a two hour movie. What what were some of those things that that really that fell out that that you were maybe surprised fell out, or um, you know uh, maybe a little sad they fell out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, the first one that comes to mind was the 94 crime bill, actually. We had done research on that, um, reached out to journalists who had an expert uh, expertise in the history of it, um, talked to a lot of people, but um, unfortunately, that's one of the areas that fell out in the Biden section. Um, in the Trump section, I'm trying to remember. Um, 
what was so challenging about Trump was that a lot of the events that we were telling were events that a lot of people had heard about, knew about. Um, and so we were trying to find a new way to sort of tell those in light of the 2020 context um, and in light of what we know about him through his presidency. Um, so his presidency actually ended up a lot shorter, I think, than a lot of people anticipated um, because there, was, there were so many other more telling uh, moments in his early life that actually tell you all you need to know about his presidency. Um, and so the presidency section ended up being shorter as a, as a result. Okay. Good. Kim, how's your sound? Are you still the same, same deal? Is that better? Feels better, but we'll see. I exited out of some things. Okay. Okay. Well, let's give it a shot and I'll, we'll, we'll move on if it doesn't work, but um, anything that you've been thinking that you didn't get a chance to, to say because of technology issues. Also intrigued by the role of the mothers. Mothers? Interesting small thread here of a tale of two different Got the Trump who's maybe distant and be engaged with the son, and then Biden's mother is gonna go none on his behalf if she doesn't do the right thing. Then she's also gonna find down the VP. You could potentially be helpful way, and your answer is no thank you. I, please explain that to your mother. And, and so I think there's an interesting... Yeah. It's there, but it's not necessarily super. Yeah. Gabby, did you hear enough of that to... I, I think so. Mommy issues. Yes. Hashtag <laughs> mommy issues. That was, uh, that was something we had on the mind pretty early. Um, you know, this is where Mary Trump just like solved a lot of our problems, right? Because we really, to be honest, like didn't have a good line into that relationship. We had biographers who helped us there. We had phenomenal Washington Post reporters who were also bi biographers in some cases, um, but that was tricky reporting. Um, and so when Mary does come onto the scene and in her book shares this account of effectively Donald Trump being uh, abandoned by his mom for that sort of really formidable age, uh, uh, you know, kind of a toddler stage. And we already know enough about his dad to know, well, he wasn't really in the child rearing business. Um, all of a sudden the sort of empathy gene that we've kind of been wondering, like, where did that, where was that sort of stunted, you know, moment, uh, the origin story of that? like we had it, right? Because we knew that something was up. Uh, later in the film, we have this scene um, in a White House briefing uh, where an ABC reporter asks the president, you know, what do you say to people who are scared? What do you say to, to people who are worried about the, 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 uh, the death numbers, right? That are increasing. And it's a, an early COVID press conference. And he says, I think, you know, you're fake news and you're a liar. And I think you're, you're the one, you know, creating the fear here. And it was sort of like, okay, here is a scene <laughs> that we would love to take to a therapist in many ways and say like, where is this kind of coming from? And, and so we, we really kind of deconstructed it and tried to go back and understand, well, um, something in his childhood um, that sort of taps into a weakness, a vulnerability, a, you know, uh, some sort of, um, anyway, yeah, it, 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 there has to be someone out there who knows that. And so thankfully it was always a question mark, but Mary ended up sort of filling that out for us. Um, and then you're totally right, like Biden's mom, to a completely different sort of contrast and, and a really fun one and, and powerful women. I mean, this is what was so surprising to me about the Biden show is like, it's like the, literally that entire narrative, that whole backstory is told by these incredible women. I just would have never guessed. And, and, and as, you know, my colleague Jim was starting to do those interviews, I was like, you're only interviewing women. Like, what's up with that? And he's like, well, the sister ran the campaign until this one. And you know, and the biographers are women and it's just like, there are just a lot of women there. And he's always sort of, um, you know, surrounded himself with, with women that he really respected. And that was obviously such a contrast to my side of the film, which there were female employees, of course, of the Trump organization, but it was a pretty different dynamic. And so um, anyway, the, yeah, Brooke and I were the only women on this production team. And so it was also kind of funny at moments to sort of say like, what do you think about this one, you know, or that idea? Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, a really great, a great question, Kim. Yeah. Well, and that kind of, uh, ties into one of the questions that that's been, uh, uh, been, uh, brought in by, by folks who are watching. 
um, to other women uh, who were uh, the first first wives of each of these men um, and the the mothers of three of each of their children um, and pretty consequential. And as the question is, um, there's a lot of focus on the first marriages, uh, less focus, although Jill Biden obviously is is very present in the film, less focus on the on on the relationship there in, in some ways. Uh, was that uh, was that a choice? Was that because of the foundational nature of those relationships and shaping uh, the lives that came later for these candidates? What what about those 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 marriages? The the focus on the first marriage, the less focus on on the latter latter marriages. Gosh, I mean, those early marriages just suck up all the air, you know, in the room. I mean, on the on the Trump side, I could speak to this, and maybe Brooke can take can take Nelia, but you know, on the Trump side, I mean, Ivanka is Donald Trump's mirror image, and so understanding, you know, his relationship with his mom uh, is one thing, but understanding his relationship with Ivanka and really uh, dissecting that is sort of almost like um, a case study in understanding how he's going to approach advisors for the rest of his life, right? So the way that that relationship sort of takes off, <laughs> the way that relationship, you know, really sort of, you know, nosedives uh, so publicly is something we sort of, you know, have seen throughout the presidency, what we kind of unofficially called the crisis presidency and the relationships with Michael Cohen and Tillerson and others just, you know, just sort of like imploding. And so, um, so we just, and Ivanka is tricky, sorry, Ivana is tricky because Ivana is, um, has an NDA uh, divorce agreement, doesn't talk about this, doesn't go there. That's hard <laughs> to sort of do. Her divorce attorney passed away. Many of her girlfriends are living elsewhere. It was just very hard to do the Ivanka story. And so you do, Ivana's story, sorry. So you do the Ivana story through Atlantic City. And so Atlantic City and Ivana are sort of like interweaved and, um, and obviously the power he gives her and, you know, the spotlight he shares, I think Scaramucci says it really well, like there are no co-stars in the Trump show. You know, that was just, she was just taking too much of the light. And I would have never guessed Scaramucci would have given us that line, but it totally kind of summed it up, which was really fun. But I'll let Brooke talk about Nelia because that is obviously a huge part of the film. I mean, I am in no way qualified to talk about uh, it in a, I don't think I would do as good of a job as Jim, the producer who was in, in charge or covered the uh, Biden section, but I can try to sum it up from what I remember from the conversations, which is, you know, for both of these candidates, um, the film sort of moves in stages and the early crises that they, that they face as children and then as young men um, really do shape how they approach crises later on in their lives. Um, and so these earlier wives and, you know, with Nelia, um, Biden loses her quickly in a very tragic way. Um, and that's a real, the, his first, I mean, among his first true crisis moments, um, he also loses his daughter in that same accident. And so I think from what I remember from the conversations was for Biden, this was a moment where he developed a real sense of empathy. Um, and this would change how he, uh, what kind of politician he was. And it became sort of a political skill that he could connect with other people who had also lost loved ones um, in a really unique way that no one else could really share. Um, it was also a moment for him, like the stuttering crisis, where um, he was determined to push through. He persevered. That was sort of, you know, he didn't know if he could be a senator, but um, he decided that he was going to, and he was going to continue his career, and he was also going to be a father to his boys. And so those two, those two lessons that he takes away from Amelia's death really end up shaping who he is as a politician for the rest of his life. Have y'all been surprised that the stuttering um, story has become so central to this campaign? Hmm. That, that has caught, I think one of the, you know, eight months ago, of course, uh, as soon as he got the nomination, uh, that would have been a, that was, that has been a surprise to me, I will say, that, that the stuttering story has become so central and 
so uh, used in, in such an effective fashion uh, during, during this campaign. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of thought the stuttering story stole this film and then definitely stole the DNC. I mean, I just, I just thought that, you know, yeah, the way that story has been managed by the campaign has been really effective. Um, and I think in our film, it, it was surprising. I mean, that, that, I don't know, just the, the way that entire scene happened was just, uh, it sort of surprised me. <laughs> I was very nervous about it. <laughs> in Rough Cuts, as I mentioned to Brooke, like, I don't know about this. I don't know, this is really, this is kind of unusual for television. And, um, and then ultimately you kind of, you see what the guy, overcame and you see how he's used it to connect with others. And it's just like, it's, it's pretty moving. Mm -hmm. um, I also think we lucked out with our interviewee, John Hendrickson from the Atlantic who just rocked. Um, yeah, and super proud of, of our team for um, doing that interview, cutting him in the way that we cut him, keeping him for, you know, a long period of time in those scenes. I mean, that, this is the hard part, right? Like you open up the movie for moments like that and you lose really important things like the 94 crime bill and, you know, um, yeah, and more White House sort of moments. And so this is, this is kind of the challenge. Yeah, I mean, that, that moment um, of, the, of the reporter from the Atlantic cut in the way it was, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen a documentary or PBS documentary or any, you know, that, that, cut in that way with that kind of patience, I thought was a really, you know, was a bold move by you all. And um, I mean, not just to have him, you know, be a subject, but cut in the way it was, I think was a real sort of shift, I think, in just thinking about subjects and interviewees and disabilities and things like that. So yeah, it was awesome. When, when did y'all do that interview? You when? Uh -huh. um, yeah, good question. Um, it was long before the DNC. I mean, like super early. Um, it was like one of our first interviews. I mean, like first weeks of interviews. It was early in the process, yeah. Super interesting, yeah. What, um, Josh, you, uh, in in your very first comments about the the film, um, talked about the the kind of the unbiased nature of the of the telling of these stories. And I'll, I'll just kind of go to, to, to Mika and Kim. I mean, to, and, and it's it's very hard because we all have our biases. We know these men very well, and we have our own perspectives on them. But did you, Tamika, come away saying this is a pretty darn unbiased take on on these guys, or did you think because of the the nature of who these folks are as people that it was impossible to uh, to kind of take out biases? So I thought maybe it's a mix of both, right? Because people are who they are. And so that will come out. Um, and I think that was what we saw. So yes, I'm biased, but I'm a bit biased as a political commentator. And so I think I was able to key in on some things and say, oh, I knew that. But then when um, the person, you know, that I probably have a much more positive view toward I was like oh I can't believe he did that and so I I think the film did what it was set out to do in showing that both individuals are flawed that they both have a political philosophy that was shaped by their lived experiences and that comes out when we see whether that person is empathetic or um, narcissistic and I think what shaped them in the beginning is exactly what we see going on right now. So yes is the short answer. Yes and no, because I just don't really know, but I, I came away knowing that it wasn't all rosy and shiny, even for the person for whom I, I, I lend my support. Mm -hmm. Kim, you wanna give it a shot? Totally agree. I was also fascinated by the focus on television Trump and Trump's ability to use showmanship. Much of what we want to say about that in the past four years is very critical. And yet theater is part of the present. Yeah, well, well said. Josh, you want to? Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely with Trump, it's like you got to go back to, you know, 80s era pro wrestling. You got to go back into the, you know, tabloid, you know, like those like low genres of, of you know, talk show television. 
tabloid press and then your and then reality tv i mean you know in, in, into the 90s i mean that is like i mean he is sort of sailing through a couple key media epics that you know anticipated this moment we're in so i mean i think getting that that sense of you know his his, his showmanship but within those particular media formations that you know rewarded you know the kind of aggressive behavior and you know the, the fast cuts i mean the aesthetic of it and the way he's able to you know control the stage in those spaces has a lot to do with how he's been able to shape you know the news cycle so yeah definitely very good so we um we're at about 15 minutes and i know uh, uh jasmine we we probably need to be uh, this has been a great conversation it's flown by i just looked at the clock it's like oh wow we've been talking for 50 minutes uh but i do want to give folks a, a a real chance to to sum things up in terms of things that that you didn't get a chance to say uh, that you think are really important in terms of of either the the creation of the story the uh the watching of this uh of this film um or the the analysis of this film um in in josser's case any i'll just kind of go around and 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 ask for 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 closing uh, comments. Josh, you want to kind of close things up for us? Yeah, I mean, um, or maybe just you know building off a couple of the, the past things um, you know that that, that you had mentioned. I mean, I, I I think there's always an element of subjectivity or, or bias. I mean, with the you know with the creating of any kind of documentary. I mean, this is my my own perspective, and um, but I mean, even with with the creation of this film, I mean, there's all kinds of subjective decisions and editorial control, making this cut or that cut, this thing's gonna, you know, be included That's you know, this other thing isn't gonna be. But I think that, you know, one of the things that this film does do, you know, is, is to still give us a kind of ethical, you know, orientation, you know, to these two candidates to confront their lives. Um, and, you know, and, you know, to allow, I mean, I think there's a great degree of, um, you know, allowing spectators to form all different kinds of opinions based on you know what they've seen and, and what's been braided together even as you know it's it's a subject I mean it's a you know a, a project from the perspective of the directors and the producers and, and and I don't think there's anything wrong with that I'm not saying that as as a critique I'm just saying that you know that is what is involved in um you know just how representations are, are crafted and art and documentary or you know journalism in general excellent good Tamika, you want to kind of... So I, I love this context of ethical orientation, right? Like that was, that sums it up and I enjoyed it. Um, and I'm, I'm as I continue to think through the film, I am thinking about stuff that I didn't know. Um, and not that I knew every single thing, but it, it probably proved to me that it is important for us to understand the full picture and someone's background so we can try to understand some of the decisions that they're making now um, and not be so angry when we see those outcomes because it is a pattern, it's their pattern. But it was extremely informative for me because um, it just showed me how much those past decisions shape exactly what we're dealing with right now and how we're having to try to unwind and think through, but that origin was always there. We just had to find it through the history books and through films, but it was right there in our faces all the time. And so I appreciate Frontline for um, bringing this Gabby and Brooke. Um, I can call you Gabby too, since Dr. Barth has done that, um, for for being here tonight and, and for bringing that and for Jasmine for, you know, coordinating and Josh for asking us to be here. But this was a really great film. And I would encourage anybody who is probably struggling about um, their candidate to watch it so they can have a deeper understanding of how things move in American politics. Mm -hmm. Kim, you. The thing I love about the choice films is the attempt to bring a non biased perspective. Even if subjective, to an extremely divisive, do that by showing us that neither one. That's the strength and the only thing. And it's to be made into American difficult moment. And then when you think about how early in the season you have to 
actually create the narrative? Yeah. So, Gabby, when was the first uh, film, uh, the first uh, choice, the choice film made? What was, what cycle was that? It was 88, actually, which is kind wow. of funny. Yeah. Oh, uh, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's so many things to follow up to Kim about there. I mean, gosh, uh, you know, <laughs> just how much political reporting has evolved since that first choice, right? Like, the atmosphere that we're producing this in is just so different than... <laughs> you know, than where we were uh, certainly back then. Um, you know, but we've always kind of had this format and this model and we've, we've had to, to Mika's point earlier, I mean, we, we sort of have gone after these folks to understand like, okay, at 13, what was this person's character? What was, you know, what was motivating them? What was driving them? Who did they know at the time? Can we get those guys into the film? You know, the childhood friends, the family, everyone who's kind of seen these two candidates grow up. Um, that's always been the goal here is like a true biopic, right? um that you interweave and in 2016 it was a blast because the two stories were just so different and they were the same age ish and so that was easier for us from a filmmaking perspective to kind of keep the periods the same right um but anyway it, it's just kind of it, this time around like one of my favorite parts of this process was at the end of each interview we asked folks okay so what is the choice and uh it's, you just got like the best faces. I mean, you just got sort of the like, whew, and like everyone sits back in the chair and like takes like 45 seconds to respond. And I don't think they're doing it because, you know, of who these figures are. I think they're doing it because they're just all, and we're all processing what this moment is, right? And where we go from here. You know, to think from 16 to 20, this is now where we are. To think about 20 to 24, I think is what people were also maybe thinking in that moment. I also think to Tamika's point, like you're also thinking like, gosh, the choice is not so clear in some cases, right? Like, and especially on race, like these are two guys that have handled this so poorly as recently as, you know, the 2008 election. And so it's just, anyway, it, it's just a really interesting time. So I, at the beginning of the film, there was that like beautiful trailer that sort of showed the history of the choice, right, since 88. One pitch we had internally was like, what if we just cut everyone's reaction to that question and we open up the film that way? Because, <laughs> you know, and then we realized like, okay, but you know, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't do that because it was just so, anyway, it was really an evocative, yeah, question. So, so Gabby, you put one thing in the, in the chat that I think is interesting. When did, when did y'all have to hit the button and say, this is it? What, what was the, when did, when did it was like the, yeah, the end of September, pretty much. So I think the last interviews we did, uh, I think it was the Jelani Cobb interview, um, which was primarily to help uh, to try and get some insight on the Harris pick because we had sort of finished up the majority of the film before that pick was was announced. And so we needed some help to kind of understand the significance of, of that selection. So yeah, we had to we had to close this up pretty early compared to the last month we've had. And Gabby was just noting that what all has happened since since that in terms of the um, president's yeah. diagnosis, the yeah. RBG death, the Amy Coney Barrett um, hearings. What else am I forgetting? Tax returns. Tax returns. Yeah. You know, I mean, just the biggest news month you could imagine. And you know, there's always talk about should we open the film back up? Should we try and skirt this stuff in? But the idea also is like you should know enough to know how they're going to react to these moments by watching this film. Mm -hmm. Josh, I want to, before I go to Brooke, I wanted to, your comment you made, do, I'd love for you to kind of talk a little bit about that from a kind of film analysis. Oh, I, I mean, that was just, it's just like a little tidbit if anyone, I mean, it was, this was from a couple years ago, but it was this little sort of interview film of Trump talking about Charles Foster Kane, the subject of the film Citizen Kane, and he has this sort of rambling perspective on Trump talking about himself and relationship to Kane and, and all of that, but I was just, I was thinking about the kind of structure. I mean, this was maybe just a kind of tangent of my own kind of film, film historical thought, but you know, in this film, The Choice 2020, and sort of thinking about how a person's past shapes them, you know, and the kind of investigative journey that, that filmmakers explore to try to, you know, construct the life of a person, you know, through interviews and documents and newsreels and all sorts of things. It's I mean, Citizen Kane is is an investigation. I mean, I saw it in, in journalism camp um, many years ago. But uh, 
you know, this film, it, it looks deep into the past of, you know, Trump and, and Biden to try to understand how the experiences in the social world around each individual, you know, shape them politically, personally, you know, fashioned, uh, you know, emotional capacity or lack thereof. And so, um, yeah, it just made me think of this, like, little Errol Morris, you know, interview film he made. It's, yeah, check it out if you're interested. But don't we, but even in what you just said, what we see is that the core really never changes. It just yeah. never changes. When you look at the news, you look at um, interviewing individuals who are closed, the decisions that are made now, people may finesse a couple of things, but the core never changes. And that's yeah. what I thought was so fascinating about this and going from the beginning of life until now, um, the conversations, the topics may have changed, but the core and the way in which one dealt with the situation just stayed the same. So that was interesting. Yeah. So Brooke, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with you and, and you obviously are, are the most recent to being, uh, to being an undergraduate student, uh, although time is passing uh, quickly. Um, you've, we've got a lot of students w watching this and I, I just love your advice to them in terms of uh, uh, those who have an interest in, in doing work in this space. I mean, what, what would you tell your kind of undergraduate self about uh, what skills are particularly valuable uh, in terms of going into this work and, and just talk a little bit about, you know, kind of thinking back to, to, to what, maybe you wish you had done or what you did do as an undergrad that really paid off uh, in, in this experience? Sure, yeah, I mean, both. Uh, you know, I think something that I will always be really grateful for, um, for that, I, that I got from my liberal arts education was just skills like drawing connections between different materials from different classes. Um, being able to read a document and sort of evaluate it for um, assertions that are legitimate and well-sourced. Um, and I think that's a really critical right now, not just for journalists, but just for everyone who is paying attention right now at a time when misinformation and disinformation are rampant online and in our national discourse. So I think those skills um, were incredibly valuable to me um, still today. Um, I also would say, you know, one of the things that I am so grateful for are the connections that I got through Hendrix. I mean, a big reason why I'm in this role now is because of Gabrielle. Um, it was great to get to know her as an undergrad and um, I connect with someone who had a similar interests and backgrounds as me um, because uh, Hendricks doesn't have a journalism program. And so you've got to get creative with how you sort of um, get experience and, and, and get, uh, get the skills that you'll need in the workforce. So um, connecting with people at Hendricks who had similar backgrounds um, as me and similar interests was incredibly valuable. Um, and, you know, I, I think something that I wish that I had done more was just um, honestly just practice. You know, I think I got a lot of experience through working on the profile and for and writing for them, um, but just practice across the board, like, you know, uh, join, you know, KHDX, um, try, you know, your own podcast, Tr try to, while you can develop all of the skills um, that Hendrix offers and uh, get creative with it. You know, I think if I had had, you know, 12 more hours in the day, I would have, I would have totally done that. Um, yeah. Good. Well, uh, first off, thanks to, to Brooke and to Gabrielle for the gift that you gave us uh, in, in this film and your colleagues. And then thanks to all of y'all for uh, providing your time tonight to have a great conversation about, uh, about this film. So uh, thank you all very much. And I'm gonna turn it back to Jasmine to, to, to tell us our marching orders.
Yes, thanks everyone for participating on this panel. I think that this was such a great conversation and I'm so glad everyone's a part of it. Um, special thanks to Brooke and Gabby for their film. It's amazing and I'm glad you guys could come out and speak about it and tell us a little bit about your process um, while making it. And special thanks to everyone else on the panel, Dr. Glick, Tamika, and Dr. Maslin. Um, you all made insightful, um, just great commentary, and I'm glad to have been a part of this conversation. And special thanks to Dr. Um, Barth for moderating. Um, he was great. Um, and now I'll just do a little shout out. Um, this Friday, we do have another screening a part of the Wingate Museum, um, the film I'm Not Your Negro, directed by Raul Peck. Um, it'll be at seven o'clock this Friday and I can post the link in the chat for people interested. Um, it's a part of the Let Us March On exhibition and I hope everyone comes out. Um, but thank you guys so much. This was great and I hope everyone has a great night. Thank y'all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>